Hello, and welcome to the Being Human podcast, where we explore what it means to truly be human, physically, mentally, and spiritually. We upload an episode of this podcast every single week, so hit that subscribe or follow button. You do not want to miss any of these episodes. On this episode of the podcast, I sat down with Olivier Leisure, or Ollie, as he is better known to us. Ollie is an artist, and in particular, a marine wildlife artist. Oli paints pieces of art that are big in scale, but incredibly detailed in their nature. The work is incredibly intricate. I went into the process of that, of course, how he actually got into painting, how he hasn't actually been painting for that long, how his work before that was all really primarily drawing based. He talked about where the interest and passion for marine wildlife came into play and how he got into diving, where he's been in the world to dive and see marine wildlife. We talked a lot about the issues that marine wildlife faces, that our planet faces, and how we combat them. Ollie definitely had some brilliant insights, and he talked about how he's not just an artist, but he is a communicator, and how he attempts to communicate messages about marine wildlife, about protection of our planet, into his art, and really use art as a medium to educate and inspire people to really act and think about how they live their life and the impact of their lifestyle. He was also very kind to bring some of his work with him, as well as some homemade ginger juice that he made, which absolutely blew my head off, but was incredibly tasty. So if you're just listening to this episode, I'd recommend that you'd go over to the YouTube video as well, so you can actually see the work that he brought with him. I hope you enjoy and find value in this conversation. If you do, please be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that follow button, hit that five stars, whatever the mechanisms are. Thank you for watching, thank you for listening, and thank you for supporting Being Human. First of all, I want to thank you for making a house a home, so to speak. You've brought me this lovely, explain to us uh, what exactly this is. Is it pure ginger juice? Yeah, that's it, yeah. So this is, uh, this is pure ginger juice. Um... I make it because I don't drink any alcohol and quite often a lot of non-alcoholic drinks are just full of sugar and I don't, I don't really get on board with that too much. So I, I made this alternative and this is the milder version. There's, okay. It depends on the Easing kind of... me in gently. Yeah, that's it. well, I, it's only because the root ginger that you need for the stronger version is not actually available at the moment. Okay. But yeah, with the stronger root ginger, it'll blow your brains out. It's really strong. Yeah. But let's, uh, let's give it a taste test. Yeah. Well, cheers. Yeah, yeah cheers. Wow, that's got a kick to it. What that's, do you mean? that's got a kick to it. Wow. Um, I, I pride myself on having a very strong palate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. You don't have to drink it all if it's too much. I realise that. Yeah, no, I like it. I, I feel like it will clear me out as well because I'm still combating the virus that will not be named. Yeah. Um, yeah. So hopefully this will help <laughs> clear out my sinuses. Um, but yeah, thank you for that. And as well, um, tell us about this piece of art that you've brought with. Uh, with you today yeah so firstly just before we get into things just want to say thanks for inviting me on your podcast oh you are i really appreciate thank it. you for coming on yeah no i think it's it's a, it's a great opportunity to talk with you i've been dead excited about it since you mentioned it so uh, i'm pleased to be here yeah um, oh likewise likewise yeah, man the pleasure's mine fan of the podcast so uh, when, when you ask <laughs> that me, means a lot man. that means sweet. a lot <laughs> to think that you know this podcast has fans <laughs> is something that's uh, a bit like surreal <laughs> but yeah. um but yeah i've had a few people come up to me and, and say that so i really appreciate it <laughs> yeah no worries mate yeah and uh, yeah so this this piece here this is um it's got a long story behind it really to be honest um uh, I'm an ocean wildlife artist, so everything I draw... Yeah, yeah. maybe we should start, before we get into the specific yeah. um, piece that you brought with, with you, because I was going to ask you that actually to start with, kind of, a, if you will, define for us what you do, um, how would you you'd describe it? Because obviously you're an artist and um, marine, I don't know if marine biologist is the correct term, but I know you actively go out on dives as well yeah. um, to kind of collect inspiration and material for your art. So yeah, if you could tell us please in, in your words what exactly it is you do. Yeah, so um, I'm definitely an artist. I um, try and look at the natural world and draw inspiration from that, literally. Um, to begin with, um, that would look like maybe drawing certain animals. Um, but one of the things that I find most interesting is how interconnected everything is. Um, you know, one ecosystem will have so many 
effects on another ecosystem and when you drill down into it it's an infinite amount of detail so that's one of the things i find fascinating and uh, so i want to illustrate the interconnectedness of that life um, which is probably why like my detail my drawings are so detailed so i use my drawings to try and illustrate the interconnectedness of life and the marine world um, that started off really with a love of marine biology but I'm not a marine biologist at all. Um, I'm certainly like a layman. I, I love it. Uh, I'm always inspired by it. And I, and I like to learn more and more and more. Um, but I have no qualifications <laughs> as a marine biologist. I did my degree in fine art. So, you know, there's, there's no marine biology involved there. Um, but the more I learned, like the more inspired I was. And, uh, you know, I felt compelled basically to go out diving and to see it for myself, to feel like what it's like to be in the ocean. Um, so I did my diving qualifications and I started diving, you know, luckily enough, like different places around the world, I've been super fortunate. Um, and from those experiences, I try and, uh, use that as inspiration to illustrate, uh, the marine environment more, uh, realistically, I suppose. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where I've started. I'd, I'd say now, um, one of the things that I've changed my classification as artist, although I, I am to rethinking how I'm an artist and trying to think of it being more of as a communicator than as actually being an artist. So I'm trying to communicate thoughts and ideas through images and paintings um, and perhaps through, you know, communication in other formats like so talking with you or holding exhibitions. And that's how I've reframed myself. So I'd say I'm an artist, but also slash communicator. And that's a very new tangent for me, being a communicator. Um, but that's how I like to see it. So um, that takes a lot of practice and I'm, I'm learning how to do that effectively. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's the roundabout way that I would describe what it is that I actually do. Of course, like diving, there's so much to that. And mm. the ocean, there's so much to that too. Yeah. You know, why the ocean? You know, a lot well, yeah, that's it. I wanted to ask you. Yeah, and then, yeah, when did you kind of discover that you had such an interest in the oceans, in, um, you know, marine biology. And what I was going to ask was, have you, have you always kind of been an artist from a young age? Were you already always drawn to being an artist? And is that the same with oceanography? Were you always drawn to the oceans uh, as well? Yeah. So from, as an artist, um, I certainly was an artist like, well, I was creative from a young age, as encouraged by my mum, um, who was always telling me to, like, to put, if I was bored, she's like, well, read a book or draw. And so I'd always end up drawing. Um, my brother, he's an artist as well. So like, he's an older brother and I always looked up to him. And so whenever he was like being creative, I was like, oh, well, I can do something too and be creative as well. Um, and more than that, I think that uh, being an artist is like a thought process. A lot of people might be, I don't know, like a novelist, for example, will use words to like, try and process their own thoughts and feelings. Um, I can't really do that effectively. I feel like the, the best way for me to process my thoughts and feelings is to illustrate them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the best way I can see it. Like, um, I've often thought that art would be a, an amazing therapy for some people um, if they haven't tried it before. Um, I've just always done art, so it was like a natural go-to for me, and I've found that it's always been like really inspirational just to try and put my thoughts and feelings down on paper. And that from a child has kind of like taken me through my whole life. I've always drawn, like I've never really stopped. Um, and uh, I, it's just my identity really. I couldn't take drawing out of my life. If I wasn't an artist, I'd probably still be drawing just because it's how I process things. I think. It's almost like journaling for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's like art journaling. Um, and that can be as superficial or as complex as you want it to be. Like it could be really, you know, trying to think about who you are and use art as a way to journal that. Or it could just be something superficial, like you just like the look of something and you'd like to draw, draw it too. Um, but it's, it's a really important function of art, I think. And it's been with me my whole life. Um, and your other question was about marine biology. Yeah. And has that been with me, like, you know, from the beginning, just like art has. And, um, I'd say that it actually hasn't. <laughs> mm. So I loved, like, I, th I don't know, when you were a kid, did you, did you love animals, like the natural world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I think most people probably went through a dinosaur phase. I remember yeah. going through a strong dinosaur phase. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I think I, I, I do, there's, there's lots of knocks on the education system, but I think one thing that is great about the education system is the emphasis they put on uh, educating you at a young age about geography and history. Because I feel like that's so fascinating to children. And I remember learning, you know, about different environments, different animals, and... I think that's fascinating to everybody. And then it's something most people lose as they grow older and you start studying things like economics and law instead. Um, you know, these man-made constructions and we lose a lot of detachment from uh, natural studies. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I definitely had that uh, fascination as well and that eagerness to learn. So yeah, when did, obviously you had that at a young age, when did that develop then into well, I mean, something more? Yeah, so just like you, I think it's a really good point that you say every, most people kind of lose that fascination and like, I'm no exception. I, I certainly kind of lost that fascination with the natural world. I don't know when, you know, teenage years probably, um, you know, did my degree in fine art and all the rest of it. And it was really like after my degree in my early twenties that I actually started thinking about it again. Um, and I think ultimately what took me back on that path was thinking about, you know, the sustainability of a person and how you might want to reduce your personal impact on the things around you. And I thought that that was like quite a nice way to try and live your life and something to aspire to, not something you could ever get a hundred percent. Well, at least I could never get it a hundred percent, but um, that helped reframe the the planet, you know, that I lived on and my attitude towards the world. Um, and from that, and thinking about, you know, my sustainable impact on the world, you know, I just was curious. And I think that curiosity about um, what it is that, you know, this planet is from an adult's perspective or from a young adult's perspective, um, really led me to down like a rabbit hole where I was like, well, I don't want to learn more about this particular environment or you know, our human impact on the world, you know, at the time. And um, then as I learned more about that, I got really involved in uh, ecology, how interesting certain creatures are. They're just, yeah, they're so interesting. Amazing, right? Yeah, like the, <laughs> what, what some animals can do, and you look at some animals and you're like, you're so far, so you, well, you, it works both ways. Some animals you look at like an orangutan, and you look at them yeah. and you're like, I'm looking at someone that is my cousin very clearly. And that's fascinating in its own right. And then you look at some marine animals that lurk at the depths of the ocean and you're like, wow, like you're an animal. You breathe, you know, maybe in a different way to me, but you, but you breathe like me. We're, we're kind of basic. We're the same thing. We're both animals. And you're like, you're so different. You're, yeah. you're, so, you're so different. That's to, right. Yeah. Particularly, particularly marine mammals. Yeah. 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 Even, um, that's it. Even both mammals. mammals. Some creatures are kind of um, by definition different, but there are those that look so different and by definition are, you know, at least the same category. Um, and so that I think is like really fascinating to see those kind of yeah. uh, those similarities and those differences. Um, and that's really what led me to the ocean. Like, you know, on, on, on land, you know, you recognize a lot of animals, you associate with them because we have experience of them every day. Like how often is it that you walk past a tree and you actually examine it for what it is. Not all that often because mm. you are oversaturated with trees. You yeah. walk past them all the time. Whereas the ocean, like you're not oversaturated with the ocean. You don't know what's there. You, you don't have like a feeling of, or, or, a, or a routine understanding of the creatures that live in the ocean. They're like covered by this veil that is this, the waves. Um, and it's only when you kind of delve beneath the waves that you kind of get a sense of what it's like to be in that environment how different that environment actually is um, and the really unusual creatures that you find there. And there is like, there's a, I don't know if you've heard of a siphonophore. I've not. Uh, please, please tell me what a, a siphonophore? A siphonophore. A siphonophore. A yeah, siphonophore. Please tell me what a siphonophore is. A siphonophore. Uh, have you heard of a Portuguese man of war? I have. That's, is it the most deadly jellyfish? There is it's in the world? It's not the most deadly jellyfish. It'll give you a nasty sting, mm. but it's not the most deadly. Okay. I think one of the most poisonous jellyfish is called an irukandji. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that, that... That sounds nasty. That's, that's, a, that's, a, whole, that's <laughs> a different conversation, but uh, yeah, they are nasty. They're minuscule, they're tiny, 
Okay. And they sting you and they like give you like enormous amounts of pain and can send you into shock and quite often kill people and things like that. Wow. The Portuguese man of war is a big jellyfish, right? It's not so big. Um, okay. They're, I don't know, they're long. So, but like mass, it depends how you describe big. Mm. If the mass of an organism is what's big, it's quite small. Okay. Because it has a, like a, a small little floating balloon-like structure on the surface. You might call it its head, but it's probably not. And then uh, beneath the surface, it's just got its tentacles. Um, and often people will think that it's a jellyfish. Uh, I, I can't kind of submit, I don't know the difference between a jellyfish and a siphonophore, but I know they're different classifications. Okay. And a siphonophore is different. Um, it's one of those organisms that I love because it makes you change your perceptions of what's possible. And the ocean does that in so many different ways. And as a, as a siph the siphonophore is a, a creature that is essentially a collection of different organisms that operate as a single organism. Wow. So it's really hard to wrap your head around. Yeah. Um, but it's a jellyfish like, like creature. Yeah. Some si I mean, siphonophores look a little abstract, you know, hmm. the Portuguese man of war looks like a jellyfish. Just, you know, but oh wait! It, so the Portuguese man of war is a siphonophore. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah siphonophore. Right. Commonly that, thought of as a jellyfish. Yeah. Right? That's so. That's really mislabeled because I. I'm sure I've been told. It's, uh, a, jellyfish. it's a, a jellyfish. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like a gelatinous creature in the sea. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I actually went diving once, and there was Portuguese man of war everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. It's a frightening experience because <laughs> uh, when you're coming back, going down is not so bad, but when you have to come back up again and you're looking around and these tentacles stretch for like meters mm. and you uh, can't really see them all that well when you're underwater, you don't want to get the stingers in your face. It's like aqua pack, man. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, trying yeah. to find a way through <laughs> the tentacles. Yeah, yeah. wow. <laughs> through the stingers. Um, but the, the examples like that is why I love the ocean. Because it makes you think about existence in a whole different way. It's completely novel to us. Totally. Like, we couldn't imagine what it's like to be a siphonophore. And I think it helps reinterpret what existence actually is. Because we have a very human-centric way of looking at the world and looking at the universe. And when you consider how other different organisms exist, it helps you reframe our existence from their perspective. And sometimes it's not really that easy or borderline impossible, as with a siphonophore. Mm -hmm. So you say, sorry, it was kind of after your degree in your early 20s that you started getting into oceanography. Um, yes, like definitely. After my degree, um, I was thinking about like, how do I do art you know, post university? Because I kind of, the university degree took a bit of the fun out of the art, although I did mm. some off the wall things at university a little bit. <laughs> Um, and I was just trying to reimagine what that was. And that looked like basically drawing what you're interested in. And I was having, as everyone does in their early 20s, have an existential crisis. <laughs> yeah. I'm all glad it wasn't just me. Though. No, no, it's yeah. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, part of that was thinking about myself and my impact on the world. And that's what led me to the natural world and ultimately to the ocean. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you very quickly acquired your diver's license and started going out there and getting very practically involved. Quite quickly, actually, yeah. to be fair, like, um, let's say I actually started being an, uh, being an artist in 2013. Uh, I got my paddy in 2014. Um, What's a paddy? Oh, sorry, a paddy is a qualification for diving. Okay. Yeah, it's just, there's two different kinds, that's just the one I did. Like a standard diving qualification. Yeah, basically. Yeah. It, allows, it certifies you to, to dive to like 18 metres or something. Okay. Um, and most good diving is down to 18 meters. You don't mm. really need to go much further than that, but yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I properly started diving a few years after that. I should have started immediately, but <clears throat> sorry, immediately, but I, it took me a few years to actually kind of take that on. And where were you going when you first started? Are there places in this country where you're able to see kind of very vibrant marine life in the way that you are? in more tropical parts? Because when, when we think about, or when I think about marine biology anyway, I think of uh, the Great Barrier Reef, places like that, very tropical places where you have all these wonderful, colourful fish, and you tend to think of the oceans in England as very dull, grey mm. masses that are probably just full of trout or something. Yeah. I've probably got the wrong fish there. I've <laughs> exposed myself as a complete non-fisherman. 
Um, but yeah, are, are there places in, in the UK where you can uh, dive and see some, um, yeah, kind of more vibrant wildlife? Yeah, for sure. Like, um, I, I haven't done an awful lot of diving in the UK. I've only done diving in like quarries, so I've not seen any of the wildlife. Um, but I know for a fact that there are, and that I've not been and gone and done it is, uh, is a separate thing. Um, it's quite cold in the UK, um, and that's always what's kind of put me off a little bit. Um, but I think uh, moving forward, I'll certainly be doing it more because I just I want to. There's a few there's a few ecosystems I'd like exposure from, and um, that's where I'm heading soon, hopefully. Okay, that's cool. Uh, they've got kelp forests, for example, which will have seals in them. I know we've got orca whales around the UK. Mm. There's sharks around the UK, basking sharks and blue sharks. I don't know if they uh, mean. Much too basking sharks are enormous sharks that are filter feeders. Okay. And um, blue sharks are these kind of more traditional looking sharks, um, but they're, they're really interesting. And we have these around the UK shores? Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, whereabouts so, in the UK? Up uh, in Scotland? Or? Yeah, in Scotland you'll have, is it Scotland? You'll have basking sharks and orca whales for sure. And then I think you can see basking star- sharks on the south coast actually. Mm, I'm not an expert in the marine environment around the UK. But yeah, that's something I'm looking yeah. to do a lot more of. I think it's, it's that common thing. You look for the adventure away from your doorstep. Yes. And actually, yes. you don't realize how much adventures there's to be mm. had where you actually are. Um, yeah, that's very true. <laughs> that's very true in terms of everything in life. We think to have an adventure, we have to go off to some distant land, but there's lots of adventures to be had. <laughs> yeah. Kind of right here in your own head, <laughs> yeah. where you are right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So um, is it just diving in quarry, sorry, that you've uh, done, or ha- have you gone uh, overseas to do diving <clears throat> expeditions? Yeah, that's right. So in the UK, it's in quarries, but I've done dive expeditions outside of the UK as well. Um, <clears throat> every dive site I've been to has been amazing, I must admit. Um, the first place I went to was in Malaysia in uh, I think it's a place called the Pensions or Pensions. Beautiful. Honestly, it's paradise. Yeah. yeah. It's honestly paradise. Um, can't believe how fortunate I was to even go there in the first place. And the diving there was amazing. Really amazing. It's the first time I went diving as well. And um, tell a lie. It's the second time I went diving. Um, but the, it was so vibrant and beautiful. And like the fish, you just, you can't, it, I feel like it's very difficult to explain what it's like to be diving because you just, so you're uh, immersed in a world that's so different to what you're used to and the creatures uh, aren't really that fussed about you being there. They're not used to you. Okay. Is, is that just because they're, the places you're diving, they've been exposed to many divers before or do you think it's just kind of in their nature that they're very happy going about what they do and they maybe don't have the same kind of awareness or fear? that we have. I think we're not a natural predator yeah. in the conventional sense, you know, like for example, um, maybe spearfishing would be, I think we're predators in the sense that we use huge boats. Yes. But when you're diving, you're not a huge boat. You're a fish just... doesn't look at us and think, oh no, it's yeah, a shark. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think so. Yeah. So, um, either way, they don't overly seem that bothered about you and they'll flitter around and, you know, it's impossible for you to catch them even if you tried. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, it, it was such an amazing environment, such a different way of seeing things. I'd already been like interested in the ocean before I went diving, and it just really changed the whole way that I saw the world and what my understanding of the sea from what I'd been learning online and stuff. Yeah. Um, the first place I went diving is interesting, actually, because that was um, the reef was actually totally destroyed. Um, and I think this is a really important point. When I was uh, snorkeling around that area, I had no idea that what I was looking at was unhealthy and I think this is one of the things that exposure does like um, uh, education and learning and you know you don't know what something's supposed to look like until you see the contrast between uh, an unhealthy reef and a healthy reef Um, and that for me was a really interesting lesson personally um, when you're trying to talk about the natural world which is what I hope to do uh, with my paintings realize that actually without that understanding is quite an abstract concept because even myself who was in, involved in that kind of uh, subject when I went snorkeling I didn't see anything wrong with, with where I was swimming um, and that's an unhealthy starting point for someone who cares about the environment you know, mm. to, I suppose a very natural one because 
you need a point of reference, don't yeah, you? Exactly. And you didn't ha you don't have a point of reference until you've actually been out there and gained the experience yeah, of exactly. a healthy reef versus an unhealthy one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so, so what was that difference like then when you when you realised how yeah, when you realised that difference? Stark. Mm. I think I was more shocked by my own lack of perception than I was about and it was a stark difference between healthy and non-healthy reef. Like one just there's there's barely any fish or the reef looks brown and kind of like moldy um any reef that there is there it just doesn't have any life kind of surrounding it it's just barren basically mm. um like and, it's had the color drained out of it yeah yeah it looks a lot like that uh it looks kind of brown dingy mm. the uh, by contrast just imagine like for example it's it's so vibrant like it's hard to it's just yeah, so I wanted to ask that as well. When, when you see it on Netflix, it does look so so vibrant, and you, you have to ask yourself, have they kind of touched that up and edited it? But no, is it that vibrant in real life? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, like the colours, I couldn't even recreate them if I tried. Mm. But they're so, they're like neon. Wow. Not uncommon to just have neon all over the place. And like, I mean, that's so, we, we don't see that. We don't see neon colours here on land. No. You know, we're even in the sky. The sun is so dazzling, but it's not neon. Yeah. In the way that you see those colours underwater. Are. Yeah. 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 Wow, right, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, so that was the first place I went diving in the Pahensians, and I was really fortunate to have that experience. Um, and I've been to Borneo diving, a place called Sipadan, which was just <laughs> <laughs> incredible. <laughs> like, talk about just having swarms of fish around you. There's a, a bait ball of, well, a schooling uh, uh, ball of jackfish. Enormous, bigger than this room, like by a good margin. And like just to swim towards them, they just kind of envelop you and they, you know, you can play with the fish almost because you can create patterns by your position. Yeah, because they just move yeah. around you. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. It really is amazing. Um, there's nothing like it. Um, and then, you know, we went down, it was, it was called a drift dive and we went down what was a, I mean, the reef was quite shallow and then we went down the cliff to it was kind of like a wall dive. And as we got to the bottom of the wall dive, um, you were carried along on a current, and it's like diving on a conveyor belt, and you have all these amazing creatures just passing in front of you, and you can just kind of sit there and watch it all happen. <laughs> it's amazing. It's like a live sushi bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah, except for you're you're on the conveyor belt. Yeah, you're on the conveyor belt. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that that was incredible. What, what an amazing experience. And um, I went diving for a week in the Red Sea. Uh, which was, you know, it's very hard to pick a favourite. Yeah, I, I imagine as well, you get a lot of diversity as well between somewhere like Borneo and, and the Red Sea, or are they quite uh, are they quite the same in that regard? Um, I Maybe to my eye, they look quite similar, hmm. but um, that's not to say that they are. Yeah, yeah, um, but, but by look they are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've not done enough diving to know if how different they are. I've got about, I've been diving just over fifty times, for example. Like that's yeah. how many wow. dives I've got under my belt. That's a lot, a lot of dives, though, right? Oh, not no. That's like no? yeah, that's like you haven't given up, but okay. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You're still learning a lot. Yeah, right? well, I'm just trying to think by comparison if I've climbed fifty mountains. <laughs> I, I don't. I haven't climbed fifty different mountains. I don't think. Well, not a. Uh, but it depends what you define as mountain. Yeah. Not to go off on a tangent. But yeah, like to me, you know what I mean? If someone said to me, I've climbed 50 different mountains, you know, using a definition like they're all over a thousand meters, so like significant mountains, I'm like, oh wow, that, that's yeah. a lot. But well, that's not necessarily I suppose it's all it's all um it's all relative, right? It's all relative. So a professional diver's done what hundreds? Thousands. Thousands. Yeah, wow, thousands okay. Thousands, yeah. yeah, yeah. One of the dive I asked one of the dive masters on the Red Sea expedition, he's a really nice guy, uh, Ahmed. Um, how many dives he'd done, and he said he stopped logging them at 3,000. <laughs> and how old's this guy? That's my age. Wow. How old are you? I actually don't know how old you are. I'm 35. 35? Wow. I did not think you were 35. I thought you were way younger. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's the ginger. It was like the ginger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 35. I've been doing this for like 10 years, would you believe? This yeah. Year, uh, last wow. year was to my 10 year kind of anniversary. So. Mm. Well, that makes sense because obviously. You're now at a, a very prominent place, and um, also the, the work you do is so incredible. Thanks. Um, I was going to ask, 
what's the progression been like over the 10 years? Because obviously you're very naturally talented as an artist, but I'm sure even though artists, painters have always been naturally talented, like with any other craft, I imagine you, you keep getting better at it, right? The, the more you do. So I was going to ask what that process was like, but as well, I wanted to ask, wanted to ask as well, kind of tailing off of you getting into diving, yeah. then how long it was before the bulk of your work as an artist became um, the oceans and marine life. Were you, what were you painting before that? Um, actually, really early on, focused on marine life. Yeah. Um, and that's why it was kind of weird for me to go diving for the first time, because it was something that I'd been studying for literally years. Yeah. So you'd already started painting marine yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. Since 2014, let's say, I've been painting marine life for like three years. And then by 2017, I think maybe it was 2017, I did my first dive. So it's three years of like studying the subject yeah. and not having actual proper exposure to it. So it was really like, it was a profound experience for me, I think. Mm. Wow. Okay. And then imagine, I imagine, sorry, uh, once you started diving, then it kind of just compounded tenfold, right? I imagine the inspiration and perspective that you gained, like you said, from actually going out there and, and seeing the, uh, the life firsthand then had such an impact on on the art you were able to produce and I, I imagine it was quite inspiring it inspired you to then produce more of this right or, or were you kind of already just you're already um more, more than inspired certainly solidified like my interest it didn't put me off um, yeah i was just it it clarified to me that this was in fact like what i love and what i find interesting um and I can't remember your question. Yeah, sorry, I asked you like three different questions <laughs> at the okay. same time. That's okay. Um, yeah, so, so I suppose that answers the question of um, then when you actually started painting marine life and, and how diving influenced that. But uh, my other question was over the past 10 years, um, the progression of your work, do you, do you feel it is a case of you actively kind of improve your technique as an artist or is it more so your technique has been formed in like your fine arts degree say, fine arts degree uh, say, and then from that point on, you're kind of just discovering what subjects bring out the best in you, if Got you know you. what I mean. Yeah, I understand, yeah. Um, it's definitely learn by doing, without a doubt. Like the fine art degree was uh, fun in a lot of ways, but I wouldn't say that I learned a lot of skills whilst I was there. Um, okay. So that was very much when I started drawing and painting. Right now, let's actually try. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Try and do this. So, um, was fine arts more about the study of art rather than yes, the practice of creating art? Yes, it was, okay. about, it was about the study of art um, and what can art be and pushing those boundaries. Um, and there's, a, there's value to that. Like, I think it helps you as a communicator because you can try and get someone to engage in a subject in different ways, not just painting and drawing. I would criticise it to say, though, that painting and drawing does take a lot of practice. And so if you don't spend three years practising those skills, you don't necessarily have that as an option to fall back on when you want to try and use those skills to communicate ideas in the most conventional sense. Um, so when I started, after my degree, um, not feeling overly confident with the skills that I had developed, um, I felt like I basically had to fall back on what I already had before my degree, which was just my natural ability to try and draw things. Um, I don't think I was ever really the best drawer. I don't think I'm the best painter and never have. I think like the scope for improvement is massive. And so over those 10 years, yeah, like you'd level, you'd really try and level up. And it's a conscious decision for me that with every painting, I really give it my all. Like it takes so much energy. By the time I've finished a painting, I'm exhausted. It doesn't matter what the painting mm, is in time. I can imagine. Um, if they're smaller, it's manageable. But like this sort of size, which is a small painting for me, takes it out of me. Um, and I started with drawing fine liner pens. You know, I've got some here I can show you actually since yeah. we're talking about this process. Uh, so literally, let's see if this is a good one. Sometimes these are a bit knackered. This is a knackered one, but it's about that fine. Yeah. Do you mind if I... Uh, that won't work, but you can try one that does work. Just to try get an idea of uh, work. Yeah, how, how fine yeah. this is for my 
meat fisted <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hands. Yeah, wow, so, so that's that's very fine. Yeah, yeah so, super, and, and obviously super, super. It's, it's got to be right for this kind of work. Yeah, um, so I, you know, I started drawing in fine liner pen out of pure random chance. Just my, completely arbitrarily. Totally arbitrary. My mum came back from town. She gave me a bunch of fine liner pens that she had randomly bought from a shop and said, here, Ollie, I'll buy you some pens to draw with. And she gave them to me and I was like, I don't want to draw a pen. And uh, I tried it and I was like, you know what? <laughs> this is pretty she good. She was right. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty good. Like, because I was, I was drawing with pencil and you'd always have to sharpen your pencils and I was always trying to get mm. that fine point. But this, like, you can just get so much detail. And I think that's where I got involved in the detail. Just the, the medium that I'd been given and I decided to try out was just so, um, I don't know, it was compelling in the sense that you could, you could always add something else. And I was trying to build complicated uh, drawings with fine line pens to begin with. And these drawings get quite big. So like I'd spend six months making a drawing sometimes. Uh, they're enormous pictures. Um, or if it's something more like, you know, this sort of size, it take me about four weeks to draw something like that. Yeah. Um, is that full, when you say draw, is that all of it from start to finish? Uh, yeah, thereabouts. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and how, uh, how many hours a day are you working? On a, on a piece like this? It can get pretty intense. It depends a piece by piece. And obviously, as I've developed over the years, my strategy has changed quite a lot. You know, when I started, it was very much um, just start, no outline, no nothing, just see where you end up. Um, and obviously that- Very spontaneous. Very, very, very spontaneous. And that can be faster in some, to some degree because you don't have to uh, plan things ahead of time and your compositions are less complicated. Um, but as time has progressed, I've really tried to make more intricate plans, develop more specific ideas about what it is I want to communicate. Um, and so, you know, a day might be waking up at five or six in the morning sometimes. <laughs> when I wake up at five in the morning, it's a bit early for me, so I end up lying down in my studio for 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then working till... <clears throat> Sometimes to as long as it takes, like sometimes ten. Wow. Yeah, so that's um, a long day. That's that is a long, long day. day. They're the long days. Yeah. I try and do nine till five because I think mm. a work life balance is really healthy and yes. it keeps your motivation. You have to be sustainable. Um, but, but if you get into the flow of it, right, I imagine you just don't want to stop. In it's those just moments. so much to do. Like you don't, yeah, you don't want to stop. Sometimes, like you, you have the goals that you want to achieve. Um, but also, when you look at the size of the drawing that you tried to do, you, you realistically have to finish it at some point. Mm, yeah, yeah. So you either do it now or you do it tomorrow. Mm. And so, like, I try and get as much in as possible. Um, and so, yeah, they're, generally speaking, they're very long days. And, like, I, I will work seven days a week, sometimes 14 days, you know, a whole month straight just on a picture if I can. And um, that's something I'm trying to rebalance now because I think it is difficult, but um, I also crave it as well. So we'll see how yeah. we'll see how that goes. Um, these days, the process is different. So I started off with drawing, talking about the evolution of um, where I've come from to now. Uh, I'm using like inks. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so these kind of basically your inks. If you want to actually, you want to try them out. You can, I have got a palette actually, but you can see what it's like. You can just yeah. uh, you can paint on paper. I don't actually paint on paper, but. And um, do you do you make mistakes? Because obviously the the benefit of pencil is you can can you rub it out, or is that uh, what's the word I'm looking for sacrilege in the art in the arts community? No, rub, no, rubbing out is part yeah, of yeah. drawing. Yeah. Um, it's sacrilege and learning to draw. Mm. There's a difference. Okay. Yeah. You can't rub out because ultimately you end up drawing the same line again. It's just, it's a, it's a weird drawing technique. If you're going to draw something, you draw it quickly with lines. If you feel like the line is incorrect, draw the new line. Then later, if you want, if you've got it right, you can rub out the bad lines. Yeah, because I, I, I see artists do that sometimes. You'll see them, you know, kind of do a fine line and then kind of do another line next to it and then kind of reinforce that one yeah. uh, more heavily rather than rubbing out uh, the, the initial one. Yeah, just... Paint a bit of that, just on the paper here. You can paint whatever you want. Um, 
I'm going to do a complete injustice to uh, to marine life and do uh, yeah. my depiction of a fish. Yeah, yeah go on. <laughs> a fish? More ambitious than that. Try a turtle. <laughs> turtle? Oh, my goodness. Well, it is my quick attempt at fish. Uh, so I went from drawing with fine liner pens to painting Yeah. with very little expertise in painting. Like, I think I last really... I've done like maybe a handful of paintings in my life. And in 2022, I decided to make a switch from drawing into painting. And um, am I right in saying painting seems like it's much harder, right? Especially uh, yeah. with the kind of work that you do, because it's very intricate. And like you, you demonstrated with um, the fine line pens, they are very precise by yeah. nature. With a brush, it's, it's much more difficult to get that, uh, that accuracy, right? I would say so. I don't well, know. I'm just, but, I'm just uh, kind of articulating what I'm experiencing now. This seems, yeah. yeah, to try and, like I said, I'm absolutely butchering this turtle. Um, yeah, t to try and uh, create a, a massive, you know, a big scale piece of art like that, but with such detail, with something like a, a, a brush as opposed to a pen, it, it seems like, you know, doing it with a pen is difficult enough, doing it with a brush seems like it's, yeah, it, yeah it, even more so. Yeah, well, I wouldn't, so I would be, I would say it's more difficult for me because I think there's people out there that would be like, no, it's, it's easy. You just don't know how to do it, which is fair. Um, because like I've been learning since 2022, that's not an awful long time. If you okay. consider, like, so you I, came to painting later. So you, so your artistry before that was very much drawing, very much drawing, very much with graphite color, honestly been afraid of for years. I bought these colors like in 2017, actually, maybe, and they've been sat on my shelf for years and years and years with me basically wishing that I could use them because I just love color and I didn't know how I would be able to do it. Um, and so in 2022, I basically took the plunge and was like, no, you're not going to make any more drawings. You're just going to paint. Okay. And I forced myself to make a change. And this is my job. This is my like basically career. Yeah. So like it's, it was scary for me to make that switch because at the end of the day, I had to f finish a painting and it, needed to sell <laughs> um, as well as it you know do the things that I wanted it to do mm. so and, and sorry to interrupt but um, was that so after your degree um, did you kind of just go straight into um, making art your full-time career or was that a, a process did you kind of have to do it on the side alongside other jobs before it took up uh, I was quite lucky I worked in retail for a couple of years um, and I like I say like I said at the beginning, I draw. That's just the way that I think. Uh, that's how I process information. Um, so I handed, I, I submitted some of my drawings to a competition, and I won the competition. I got some money, and I was like, "Oh, cool! Maybe there's something to this." So I started selling artwork here and there, and um, I did some art fairs, some craft shows, some like low key ones. Did well there. I won another competition. I was like, "Wow, this is it's brilliant." <laughs> I'm making a better living doing this than I was before. So I carried on and like I, I, you know, I was doing what I loved. Um, and I then started doing some art fairs, some big art fairs in London, um, which is an art fair is like, have you ever been to a trade show at all? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, white walls everywhere um, with loads of different artists, hundreds of artists. And people come through and they talk to you and you engage with them about your artwork. And, you know, you're there to make a living as well. So hopefully they buy some stuff. Um, and that's really where the ball started rolling. And I started doing bigger art fairs um, for me and got some commissions, did some commissions and, you know, got into what it is to actually be a working artist. And then I imagine as well uh, with social media becoming more than just kind of people posting about their daily life, but becoming a, uh, a platform for people to help propel their careers. I imagine that just helps you be able to um, market your art and market your services even more so, right? Absolutely. Actually, really early on, um, I just used to give prints away for free, like on, because I just thought it'd be a nice thing to do. Um, so I'd make a drawing and then just like, I'll share this, you know, and I'd send you one in the post. I remember like I had to send out like 900 uh, prints one time. And, like, mostly around the UK, thankfully. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was pretty expensive. But like it, it was something that I, I really like just sharing art just with people. If they like my drawings, it's no harm for me just to send them something. It's kind of fun. It's nice. It's a nice thing to do. Yeah. Um, 
and that's actually I, I, I kind of started using social media like that and realized that there was you know something to it um, and started using it more to try and promote my art and talk about you know what I love about marine life and you know, how interesting these creatures are yeah. and, and that's really where I'm at now I think is um, with this project um, trying to talk about and use your art rather than being as an artist making these pretty pictures on top of that is it possible to use your art to communicate messages and on top of that possibly um, get people to be inspired maybe make a change um, relate to the ocean more think about the ocean in a different way maybe think about their impact on the world and, and that's really where i am at the moment um, but yeah it was it was a uh, a long process really for me to get there but um and i think i've always been there actually it's just that i think my my approach was naive before so i draw a, a painting of a, of a like for example of a sperm whale it's huge imagine two meters sperm whale drawn with like fine line of paint mm. really intricate and the idea was like let's celebrate the ocean world like let's show people how amazing this is how amazing this creature is Sperm whales can dive to like two kilometers below wow. sea level on a breath. You can't do that. <laughs> you can't do that. Like that would literally destroy you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you just this, implode, right? Yeah. And, and, and this creature can do it and like it comes back up again. That's just how it's adapted. That's how it's evolved. And these creatures are amazing. They're products of like thousands of years of trial and error, millions of years of trial and error. And, um, these are things that we can see, that we can study. That we're fortunate enough to have them in the planet. And, and like I was like, if I can celebrate these creatures, if I can show how amazing this environment is, maybe people will care more about it and hopefully want to protect it, right? Yeah. But I don't think that's true, actually. I think that's naive. I think, like, although it's good intention, ultimately, if you don't talk about certain issues, the person isn't aware that they exist. Yeah, and as well, I think we just want to have our cake and eat it too. Like people want to look at pretty pictures and go, oh, wow, that's so fascinating, but then not actually take action to ensure that uh, we're able to maintain yeah, um, of course. What, what actually underpins this art. Mm -hmm. You're looking at this picture of this beautiful sperm whale. Well, there'd be no drawing of this sperm whale if this sperm whale didn't exist. And the way we're damaging our oceans, there will be a day, I don't know um, <coughs> how common or rare sperm whales are, but there'll be a day where species such as that uh, won't exist and, and that day could be very soon for a lot of species but we we don't make that link even I think a lot of us know it as well but we get caught up in you know our own selfishness our own life and yeah we enjoy looking at the pretty picture and saying oh wow isn't it fascinating and we don't want to face the reality that hey look we're actually taking this away and we actually have it within our power to to not to not take it away to preserve it so we can continue to be inspired um by its beauty and by the works of art that are produced um from from the thing itself so i i think that is part of it as well it might be quite a cynical perspective but i do think part of it is us humans we do just want to have our cake and eat it as well i don't, I don't think it's cynical i think it's and i think it's personally re uh, i think it's reasonable as well um you know, you don't, people have busy lives. They, they see basically, they experience what's around them and it's very difficult to engage with a subject that is actually abstract like the ocean because it doesn't relate to you every single day. Like you don't experience it. Um, and I, I don't think people should be too harsh on themselves for not feeling like they're changing the world. Like, you know, either because they've looked at a painting and like, oh, that is beautiful. Or oh, maybe they've got the message. It's like, maybe I should do something about it. Or, or not like I think it's a natural process we've gotten to this point because we are efficient creatures we, we know how to use technology to like fish more fish provide more food for a growing population um, consume products because we engineer things um, and that's ultimately just naturally what we what we do there's nothing wrong with it um, but I think it, it is important to try and balance that um, if you can, and I'm not about to, oops, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> um, 
I'm not. Yeah, yeah. I'm not about to. Um, <laughs> not about to stand on the soapbox and tell anybody how to, <laughs> to, how to live their lives. Like I make all sorts of mistakes. Like I'm not perfect. Like I make all sorts of errors. Life is imperfect. That's the reality. What you're aiming for isn't perfection. You're trying to hit like just better middle ground. Yeah. You know, it can progress. progress. Can you improve? If you're interested in improving, you know, maybe try, like it doesn't take all that much. You know, you could do it in all sorts of ways depending on how far down that line you already are. Um, I slip up all the time, you know, like it's not a, a, a static thing. I think it's a constant battle. Um, and uh, it communicating and trying to drive this idea in my art that there is an issue is part of me trying to improve a bit. Like saying, in reality, I want to try and preserve the natural world if I can. In, the, in my specialism, which is art, which is quite far removed, right, from the natural world. I'm not a scientist. I can't bring up data and say, this is an important fact you must pay attention to. Mm. But then um, art's able, I think, to highlight things that science isn't at times. Yes. So, so my hope is to do exactly that and try and use what information I can learn to, to communicate and take that as a responsibility uh, as an artist. As I was saying before, artist and communicator to try and uh, to merge the two if if they indeed they need merging they might be the same thing um, and say you can't just celebrate the natural world anymore ollie you, you can because it is worth celebrating but also try and talk about these issues in your paintings um, and this was like uh, an existential moment i had about my own progress i spent years trying to do something and realize mm, actually I wasn't doing it efficiently or the best to the best of my ability or properly. Um, when Duncan, <coughs> excuse me, no problem. Yeah, um, Duncan um, from Fishbowl Films and Dan um, approached me about doing an interview about my artwork, and I was like, "Brilliant! Of course, yeah, I'm happy to interview." Bit nervous about it. Big lens in front of my face. That's <laughs> fine. Let's let's see. Let's give it a go. Um, and I realized in that process of being asked that, like, uh, I thought about what it was that I was doing all, all that much more. I was writing down ideas beforehand. I was trying to think about what it was I wanted to talk about. And I found myself lacking. I looked at myself and thought I wasn't good enough. And, you know, I thought, how can I at least improve on that? And being honest about, you know, what I think is a problem, where my stand, take a stance on something that I care about, um, and try and illustrate those things within my paintings was, for me, part of the solution. So um, that was a really intense period. Not only had I, I just basically started to learn how to paint um, in 2022, um, but also I was kind of doing this interview documentary, um, Atlas, um, which you can find on YouTube, um, which I found personally very intimidating and I got used to the, to the experience, but, um, and take on what is essentially a mammoth project. So Atlas is here, essentially. And this is my attempt to create a symbol of the ocean. So this was the plan. I don't know if we can see it. Can move a few things. Yeah. 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 Um, um, and I'll describe it as well because it's a podcast. <clears throat> so it's Atlas. Are you familiar with the Greek Titan Atlas at all? I'm not. I should be. As a man that professes to be all about philosophy, I should be, but yeah. enlighten me. I so my understanding of the Greek Titan Atlas is Atlas was cursed by Zeus to bear the heavens on his shoulders for eternity. And um, as I was thinking about a concept to work with that might symbolize the ocean and our relationship to the natural world, I thought Atlas was a, a perfect candidate, basically. Atlas is bearing the heavens on his shoulders, so the turtle bears the, the heavens on his or her shoulders. Mm. And uh, Zeus is humanity that has cursed the turtle to do so, to take responsibility for its own environment. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was a really good concept. Yeah, I know it is. Um, not to mention that turtles are seen as like these kind of creation myths. They are part of creation stories around the world. It's super interesting. Are they? They are. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. So obviously you have Discworld, right? You're familiar with that by the author Terry Pratchett, where there's a fantastic world that's being carried on the back, the flat earth on the back of four mm, elephants that's being yes. carried on the turtle. The Discworld, the greater turn. 
is a, a popularized uh, story from uh, Hindu culture, I think. And then you have like a turtle called Lanupe, which um, I'm not entirely sure of its origin, but the turtle comes onto land, grows a tree, drops two seeds, one is a man and one is a woman. Um, and there's a, there's a Chinese uh, story of creation uh, that's based around a turtle as well, where um, oh, I can't fully remember it. The turtle, for some reason, <laughs> I think gets its legs cut off. <laughs> yeah. And then it holds up the heavens. Mm. So it's turtle legs that hold up the heavens. Okay. Really unusual. Yeah. But they recur around the world. Mm. Um, and I need to do more research on it, so I'm more accurate. But I found that the world turtle, the turtle, and Atlas all merge into one pretty powerful symbol where I could recreate a contemporary world turtle called Atlas uh, that reflects the world today in all of its marvels, because the ocean, as we've been talking about, is an amazing place, um, but also try and address some of the issues that it faces today because of you know, climate change, overconsumption of you know, overfishing, um, and human impact and the destruction of natural habitats. And challenge myself to say, can I do it? Can I do enough research to understand the subject in a nuanced fashion so I can communicate these issues and not be hyperbolic if, you know, if it's not necessary, but actually realistic? Tread the line between that humans actually need technological development um, to make our lives better, and fighting against that is unrealistic. Mm. Um, so not saying, you know, oh, just needlessly destroy environments. Environments get destroyed for a reason. Um, and that's because human humans require the minerals, maybe, that uh, exist there to, to make our lives better. So find that line between being an environmentalist, where these uh, environments are very precious, like, you know, they've evolved, the, they're the um, outcome of millions of years of evolution and thousands of years of, like, localised development, I guess. You know, like, if you destroy an ecosystem, it can come back. Um, and these precious environments are getting destroyed. Like they're basically unique gemstones that you can never replace. Mm. So how do you balance human development with uh, you know, the natural environment and present that human condition as an environmental painting within the concept of Atlas? Um, yeah. And so Atlas, this turtle, this, is, this draft here was the plan I, I made uh, to kind of try and get a, a good sense of what composition I was going to create. Probably takes me a couple of days to make a plan. Um, and then the painting itself was four weeks uh, work um, whilst also being interviewed and stuff like that. So it's, it's symbolic of the reason I brought this painting along is because it's symbolic of a, a personal change within me to try and be better, basically, do a better job of communicating the issues and um, really try and talk about the ocean in a way that I haven't before. That's all? Um, yeah, go on. I, I feel like it's... I do, I feel like it's... Uh... Reinvigorating me. See if I can do a better job. What? Yeah, you're much better at See pulling it than me. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll top myself up whilst I sit. So, um, you took on this project, Atlas, and as you said, you were having to balance two things. Obviously, the work itself, which is difficult and intense enough Yeah. Um, anyway. But then also as well, the kind of social element of it, of having to market it, it's not the right word, having to present the art and explain the social reason behind it. And like you said, explain the issues. And, and let's go into that. I think obviously we kind of all know the issue in large. Um, like I said, obviously we're not all marine biologists and um, you know, environmental scientists. But we know there's obviously some people dispute this, but I, but I, I feel like we know that humans are polluting the earth, um, and that this is called, this is having you know a massive impact on climate change. And like you said, you were talking about the relationship we have uh, with the earth and with these ecosystems, and how we have to balance human development alongside preservation of them. And I think we have gone way too far in viewing the earth as a resource to use for our advancement and not viewing it also as not just a habitat to us because we're selfish and we you know, view the world from our perspective 
humans being at the centre of it, not just as a habitat for us, but then also as well a habitat for all other life. And that that shouldn't necessarily be less important than human life. Um, again, I'm going to ask you two questions at once. What, what do you think about that in terms of how you frame human life versus the life of animals, the life of marine animals, and as well in terms of the issues, just speak, speak on the issues in themselves and what exactly we can do to help combat them? Um, I think, you know, obviously humans are animals too. We're all part of the same system. Um, well, that's it, human life. Yeah, sorry, I made the distinction human life and animal life, but yeah. we are animals, aren't we? We're animals. I think it would be good to humanise animals more. And I wouldn't say in a, a you know, anthropo anthropomize them, you know, like act as though they're humans, but see them as equal. And I think quite often it's not that you should bring humans down and say, you know, you're lesser than you think you are, but you should bring animals up, right? The other animals, the other species up and say that they're valuable in their own right. And although we don't necessarily understand their perspective, because it's hard to put our brains, take their perspective, if you see what I'm saying, um, we should value them for what they are. And I don't think that really happens an awful lot. People dehumanize things. You know, you get called an animal. It's not a good thing. Yeah. It should be yeah. a positive thing. You know, mm. like you could argue, yeah. you get called a human, you know, that's not, you know, oh. <laughs> but, uh, being called an animal shouldn't be an offensive term. Like animals are equal in my eyes and all things have a right to life. You know, you know, I suppose creatures eat other creatures. You know, they have a right to do that too. Yeah. There is a, um, a natural circle of life, right? There is. Yeah. Animals but, kill other animals. It, it's not just humans that yes. kill animals. Yeah. Um, an animal, and as well, uh, other animals killing other animals, it's not done, you know, in the nicest, most no, humane no, way either. No. That's, not, that's not to excuse how humans treat animals, and, no. uh, you know, factory farming and that, those kind of things. But it's important to acknowledge there is a natural circle of life that is pretty brutal in reality, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, life is brutal, no doubt about it. I just think that you could elevate animals from being subhuman to yeah, being on par. Absolutely. And then it I might totally change agree. your attitude towards certain creatures certain circumstances dehumanizing things has commonly been a really good way of like taking advantage of those things even if it's been other humans you dehumanize them you know and then there's no rules you can do whatever you want they're not they're subhuman and i think that's a really dangerous thing to do like mentally it's a bad perspective no matter what you're trying to treat you know if it's another human it's not good if it's another animal i don't think it's good either you should try and treat things equally if you can and also realistically realizing that it's a brutal world we live in and you know there's life and death things get killed yeah but then as well because we're in this elevated position for lack of a better word now as humans we are kind of running the world in the sense that we do have such a massive impact yeah. on it and we are you know so intellectually and technologically technologically advanced that we're now in a position where we are able to carry out the circle of life in a more humane way. A lion, you know what I mean, doesn't have much um, control or ability to be able to, you know, kill its prey more softly in a nicer way uh, to, you know, fulfil its needs, fulfil its advancements in a more subtle, less harmful, less brutal way. But we as humans, we do. So I think it's, like you said, that there's that balance between ultimately in order to continue advancing humanity, there is a certain amount of harm almost that needs to be done as a by, uh, to the environment as a byproduct. But I think it's important that we minimise that as much as possible and do that as humanely as possible. Um, but yeah, and sorry, this, the second part of the uh, question, I've really lost my trail of thought was, uh, yeah, b b balancing those, those two elements. And um, what, what is it, sorry, that was it, what exactly we can do to combat these issues? So, yeah, I think, I think just going back a second onto what you were saying there, and I think, uh, you know, we do obviously have, sometimes have the ability to try and minimise our harm to animal, to an animal, like not, for example, torture it before you kill it. Yeah. Um, that's less what I mean, I think, more overconsumption, I think the issue that we right. have is battling our ability to be amazing engineers, create huge vessels that can take up a whole bunch of fish 
and what actually whether that's pushing the limits of our planet and uh, you don't want to destroy an ecosystem because ultimately it's bad for humans too um, and I think we just have to tread carefully at that point you don't want to uh, destroy too much and then it can't recover because all these creatures actually serve a function and help the healthy functioning of our planet and now i've forgotten your second part of the question no no that's right that was it that was a really good point i think that's uh like you said only doing what we need to do only taking what we need and not over consuming because i do think there is a lot of over consumption and there's a lot of waste right yeah and then that kind of creates a vicious cycle we take too much from the environment we waste it and then we pollute that back into yeah. the environment as refuse um, so, so that's a brilliant it's, point. It's, I, I'm using humanity as an umbrella here, but I'd just like to clarify that obviously country by country that is very different. Um, yeah. Like there are some countries that certainly don't do the kind of level of damage that another country might do. Mm. So like that's just worth bearing in mind that I'm talking about umbrella humankind. Um, we, I think we, it's important to try and mitigate our ability to really leverage uh, our fishing tactics, for example. Um, using the technology that we can develop uh, and say maybe there, there ought to be limits just because if you give nature a chance then it can recover and then there's more fish for the next generation for example and that would yes. be a good place to be in um but yeah it's not that every country is is equal there are certain yeah of course like over yeah versus another country is is a mm. different level yeah just worth bearing in mind i think yeah no definitely yeah, but, but obviously at the end of the day, we have to frame it kind of as the mm -hmm. as the overall umbrella because we are all part of the, the same race. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I completely <clears throat> understand that. And then you 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 answered the um, the second question that I asked there, which was um, how exactly do we combat those issues? And I think you explained that perfectly. Yeah, in sure. the, It's about moderation. It's only about taking what we need, not over consuming, uh, not creating waste that we then just pollute back into the environment. Um, yeah, it's a difficult problem, no doubt about it. It is right because, it, because like you said, it's about being realistic. Because it's because I, I can fall into the idea of being very idealist. Because I, I, you know, I'm a real big fan and real big proponent of connecting with the natural world, not harming the natural world. You know, almost kind of throwing ourselves back into the past of this golden age of hunter gathering, where you know. The world was in perfect balance. Ecosystems were in perfect balance. We're not going to go back there. We can't. You, what, we're going to get rid of every city, every piece of, you know, every synthetic thing that man's created. We're not, we're not going to do that. Um, so it's hard to let go of that ideal and say it's, because it, you don't want to say it's not achievable, but it is about being more realistic, isn't it? To, to, if, we, if we want to do things like end world poverty, we can't necessarily slow down human advancements or stop human advancements. There's other issues in the world. So it's to being realistic and, and trying to solve other issues whilst combating the issue of, you know, not destroying uh, these beautiful ecosystems. It, it's, it's hard, right? And I don't know if anyone's got the answer. Some people may, you know, purport, purport, purport to have the, uh, the answer, but uh, it's such a complex issue. I think there's no perfect answer. I don't think that I think it's possible to solve like human suffering and poverty and also not destroy the environment. Yeah, um, that's it. I, I want to believe that. I want to believe that we can do that. I think I think and it's that possible. That should be the goal. Yeah. Uh, the goal, sorry. Yeah, I, I, th I think it should be the goal. I think it can be the goal. I think that's actually kind of where we're moving toward as well. I think we're doing. It's clear that people are concerned about the environment a lot more. It's in the news. People are talking about it. When I first started painting like this sort of thing ten years ago certainly wasn't as common to mm. like have an environmental stance on things whereas these days like certainly it's a lot more normal and that's good and change takes a bit of time but when change happens i think it happens faster than you think yeah and but I'm you've seen optimistic. that change you've seen that change over the past 10 years socially yeah socially for that's sure. good that's encouraging yeah and um i have been pessimistic uh, you know, with regards to policy change and you know technological change, but I think that's just lack of exposure and lack of understanding. Actually, not being part of that conversation, not being at the table. Obviously, I'm an artist. <laughs> I, I learn what I'm learn from field work. You know, going out diving, trying to learn from scientists and things mm. like that. But again, like then, I, I think a lot can be learned from that. So then, think you're able to commute as you said, you're a communicator. Not just, I think an artist is a communicator. And through art, you're able to communicate things in ways that an economist, a science, you know, an environmental scientist 
you know, standing at the World Economic Economic Forum wouldn't be able to convey in a way to people. So I, th I think what you're doing is is really important, and it's probably able to um, help capture people's goodwill and um, consciousness in ways that other mediums aren't. I hope so. One thing, art is quite unique in the sense that you're creating images and an image has an impact immediately, even though you might not be able to consume the whole image at once. So like some of my paintings are very complicated, you know, like there are loads of details, you can dive into it. Um, but unlike a book, it's almost showing you its entire, all the script is right in front of you on one piece yeah, of paper. Yeah, you can't get the big picture of a book by just kind of like picking it up and going, yeah. flipping through it. You can look at it, even though you, like you said, you don't look at all the details in the painting right away. It automatically gives you an image, an impression, mm -hmm. just from looking at it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where I've that's where I realised that's where the power of what it is that I do lies. If art is powerful, it's a powerful tool because imagery is a powerful thing. And if you can leverage your ability to create images, you can hopefully uh, affect change. Um, and that's my mission, basically, trying to affect change with this project. And this is a four week painting, but the actual project itself is a multi year painting. I've been working on it for six months so far. I wish I had it here to show you. It's just so annoying. Yeah. I'd need a loop. How, how, how big is it? It's uh, two square meters, thereabouts. Two square meters. Uh, you know, if I was yeah. to reach up standing, I'd you know, be about that tall. And, and when do you envisage uh, finishing this? Well, last year I said this year. And this year, I'm saying next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I started planning it, as I said, in 2022. Um, and that planning process involved these two paintings and um, another behind me. I can pop it up just to show you. Yeah, yeah, no, please, by all means. This is, uh, about there, around this sort of section here, basically. So imagine that section of this painting behind there uh, at scale. So when this whole turtle is wow. at scale, it's this large. Yeah. Um, and this was another uh, part of the process of planning this painting, where um, I enlarged a certain section, imagined what it'd be like when you're painting it two square meters, um, to see what that would be like to, to tackle and, and how that changes the process. And it changes it massively. It's mm. really difficult. It must be so hard to get the perspective right on a piece of art that big. I mean, you must have to kind of measure out you, yeah, you, you must have to take measurements, right, of this this painting, this part here has to be, you know, uh, so and so metres or point of a metre by, by such and such in order for it to fit properly in with the rest of the pieces to make the whole the whole piece, right? Yeah, I've got a cheat code for that, actually. Okay. Right, so I painted um, the one behind here, and then I took a scan of it and projected it onto the oh, canvas. Okay. So it was a lot yeah. easier. Then again, I did also change the composition a bit but that helped a lot and when you're talking about a massive project not worrying about the uh, initial proportions saved a lot of time um, nevertheless I'm six months in on it and it is like by far the most complicated painting I've ever tried to make yeah by a country mile not only like does it require like proper research into ideas and hopefully develop a good understanding of fairly nuanced issues. Mm. That's it's, it because it's got to be accurate to the reality I'm trying. That, it, that, it, that underpins it, that was the inspiration for it, right? That's my yeah. goal, accurate enough and, mm. and symbolise things in a fashion that someone could understand areas of the ocean that are otherwise quite niche, right? So niche issues, but hopefully try and communicate those issues in images. It takes a lot of learning, it takes a lot of thinking about how you're going to do that and it takes a lot of time to actually implement it and mapping it out in my head has just been like difficult yeah even when it comes down to you look at a picture what's the first thing you're going to see how can i make something look like two different things you know how can i really confuse the eye in some areas and then otherwise direct the eye um, what symbol do i use to try and illustrate a certain idea or, or thought process it's a mammoth task, not only to paint it, but also to research it and to go out there. One really important thing for me is to go out there, actually do some field mm. work. So, you know, if I want to learn about 
um, kelp or seagrasses, for example, which are really important ecosystems around the UK. I'll go to learn about those ecosystems, talk to people, try and understand the subject properly, and then hopefully use that experience and, and turn it into paintings. Yeah. So just to clarify, the uh, the massive overall project of Atlas that, like you said, is going to take you probably into next year, yeah. uh, potentially beyond, is it is that Atlas and the finished product is going to be the enlarged two metre by two metre version of that and it's a matter of kind of blowing up each section of it and going and uh, creating a bigger more detailed piece of it to then fit them all together to create that image. Uh, yes that's correct so well I'll show you a picture and maybe that'll help I realise this is a podcast. Um, yeah no I need to up my uh, my technological abilities and try and, um, Here we go. So try I don't and know put them on the screen. It, but... So yeah. that's the painting I'm trying to finish. It's a two meter painting. Um, these sections here are painted. This was just the first one I did just as a trial before I did that enormous picture. Yeah. Um, now I'm just taking a section and like in my sketchbook, I might plan a certain section. So I think about the composition, all the issues that I want to kind of address, maybe illustrate which part of that composition I want to tackle that particular issue in and then sketch it out to try and make sense of the, the the problem yeah um, and to, to create a, a painting that is essentially awe inspiring yeah right? and that's i'm not saying that's easy or that i'm capable i uh, i i'm gonna say you're absolutely <laughs> capable <laughs> absolutely but, capable but bear with me right so that's a, that's a that's a heck of a challenge to set yourself right an awe inspiring painting not easy um but i believe that aesthetics um, it has to be awe inspiring in order for you to be able to engage to catch someone to engage in a subject yes. this nu nuanced this irritating some might say like you know, you get picked on for saying you're not good enough or like you, you're not being sustainable enough naughty human yeah. like it you, you don't want to be told off all the time yeah so yeah. It, it to try and have it talk to you in a fashion that you can relate it doesn't feel like it's on a soapbox saying you're a bad human being. Yeah, that's and, it because we don't want to listen. You know? No, we, we don't. We don't want to, to hear those things, even when they're completely true. Well, so yeah, they are true. They are true in yeah. part, and 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 also I think though, like everybody's a hypocrite. Like, so you can't yeah. you can't point down at someone and say you're you're the problem because you can look at yourself and find a problem there. Too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this painting for me really needs to be huge impressive and able to engage with someone in a fashion that's next level to any other painting that i've tried to make and i mean it's not disappointing I've, i never thought it'd be this intense honestly i had no idea that it would be this difficult but it is by far and away the most difficult thing i've ever challenged myself to do hands down mm. and i feel good about it <laughs> yeah that's great that's good great it. it's, it's good to challenge yourself and like <coughs> i have the privilege of being an artist and so I feel like it's my responsibility to push the envelope to give it everything I've got every time um, and on top of that take responsibility for the subject I'm talking about and um, do justice to the ocean and really try and be a fair communicator um, of, of my subject and, and this is this is the culmination of like basically 10 years of learning about a subject 10 years of improving I think personally and um, technically within my work and taking it to the next level um, and I'm looking forward to really mostly to the journey like I'll be painting this in the space in exhibitions and stuff like that because yeah the end result is going to hopefully be brilliant but the journey the creation of it is mm. also part of the story yes and I think it's really important to take people on that journey so you know to formulate an exhibition where they can see you're working in the space, they can see how intense the, the process is, they can ask you questions whilst you're there, they get a sense of what the ocean actually is. How do you communicate, not only through your paintings, but in an exhibition setting? Uh, that's a really yeah. important question. So you're, you're painting it as you're exhibiting it? Yeah. Yeah, wow. I, re I really like that. And um, I, I think that's a brilliant way of again, being able to convey that message best you can to people. Because obviously the finished product is awe inspiring. Um, but again, people can be naive. People can see a, a finished product and yes, be inspired by it, but then they don't appreciate, they don't know how much went into that. And if people are actually able to see on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, see you at the beginning of it, see you 
at the middle point of it, they're able to see what a monumental work, the piece of work this is and how much work has gone into it. And I think that only serves to inspire people more and to convey the message even stronger. I think so. You know, like one of the things I thought was, you know, I don't, how do you, how do you take authority to talk about a certain subject? How, how do you feel like you can share your opinion and that people think that you're worth listening to? But I think everybody shares similar thoughts and feelings and approaches to life. And so just trying to articulate those things using images as a painting um, is worthwhile. And uh, I think people would appreciate the perspective. Um, and so I'm really, really looking forward to basically putting it on exhibition and, and painting it in the space and just getting people's reaction because, um, you know, and hearing their perspective because it's always so important and helpful for me to hear. And yeah, I, I, I really can't wait. And the exhibition really is just as much part of the process as the painting is itself. Yes. Um, hearing people, their perspective, how they interact with the work, like how they interact with the, the space, what their thoughts are on the issues, really helpful. Because mm, it's a great way to encourage conversation, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, and like, I don't know the answers. So like your perspective has been valuable to me because I only have my own to go by. And without like accumulating basically every other person's perspective, it's very hard for me to know what the group thinks. And I'm hoping that this is a painting that's like a group painting, if you like. Um, it reflects the moods and the feelings and the thought processes of people about the natural world, because we all share it. It's all part of our planet. It is amazing, you know. And I think that's that's worth that's worth trying to kind of consume to understand mm. yeah. the perspectives of others. It's really important for me. Definitely. And uh, I did want to ask you kind of um, more about the specific elements of your process, the environment that you paint in. Obviously. I like we've just talked about you're going to be painting this in the exhibition where it's being exhibited mm -hmm. as it's being exhibited. I imagine that's not typical of um, your paintings, right? Where do you usually paint? Do you paint at home or do you have a specific studio you go to? And how important is that environment? Like, do you like to paint with music in the background or does it have to be silent? Kind of talk me through the, the specific elements of it because w with me, I, I'm just kind of comparing it to, you know, um, oh, me as a writer is not what you are as an artist. Obviously, you're a professional artist. I just kind of write you know, more for myself and I, I do share it, but uh, it's by no means my profession. But, um, you know, some people like to have kind of instrumental background music on when they're writing. And to me, that's just a complete kind of thought blocker. I, I don't need silence. I can have normal, everyday background noise. But if I have, I feel I put something very purposeful on in the background like music then that kind of takes away the creative process to me i kind of need that blank canvas in terms of an environment in order to be able to do my best work so i'm curious yeah what it's like for you so i work from my home studio <clears throat> it's pretty rudimentary to be honest i have a spare room in my house that's where i work a lot of the time bigger paintings i can't you know maybe take up the stairs so i paint them literally in my living room um, and the process is different depending on the day, obviously. Um, if it's just, I have no other commitments, all I'm doing is painting, um, then I tend to listen to music, but I also watch a lot of documentaries. I try and do as much learning as possible whilst I'm painting, because actually that really helps inspire my painting. There's so much to learn. The, the more I have, the better. And it actually changes what I'm painting as I'm doing it. So it's a really important part of that process. Uh, I get into a bit of a weird place sometimes. Like I can paint for literally like more over 12 hours a day. The longest I think I've ever painted has been 17 hours in a day. Wow. And um, I listen to one song, one three and a half minute song on repeat <laughs> for 17 wow. hours. Yeah, it's a bit weird, like, but... I think it helps. Well, what, what song was that? Just out of curiosity. Uh, it's a really random song, you know, like I, I kind of discovered it a year or so ago and I was just, boom, that was it. Um, it was, it's Letter from Letter from a Thief by Chevelle. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to listen to it. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. If it's good enough to play on 17 hours. It must uh, be a good song. Yeah, I mean, I love Chevelle. 
um, I'm not even sure it's their best song, but I just, you know, when he ca something catches you, yeah. and I just settled on it, and that's apparently, that's just what I needed for that day. It just got you in the groove. Yeah, I just had to listen to it on repeat, and nothing else would do. It's really weird, and I had to listen to music because I had so much to do. Like, I had to finish that painting, and um, I could not be distracted in any way. And it really helped, and I do that now still. Like, I do listen to songs on repeat, and I do... I have basically been listening to Chevelle whilst working for like a year and a half. <laughs> so if Chevelle's listening to this podcast, yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll you happily... must be in like their top not point not what five percent. I think I'm their top listener. Yeah, yeah, on Spotify. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, they got some class songs. Check them out, Chevelle. Uh, yeah, my brother put me on them. It took me like ages for actually for me to listen to his recommendation. And then you know I'd listen to one song. I listened to that on repeat. Then the next one would come on by accident and then I'd like, oh, okay and then i'd listen to the other one on repeat again and then that's how i get into music i have to listen to one song at a time it's a bit strange but that's just how I uh, I'm, I'm similar oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you find the one you like and yeah then the yeah and then it's just you in. <laughs> yeah yeah it's that played 70 times over yeah so i can find another one now <laughs> yeah so so that's what it looks like i've got a really bright studio light um i can work all hours of the day but i try and work nine to five Realistically, to finish some of these paintings, it requires a lot more than that. This is a six week painting, basically, and um, I worked wow. very hard to get it finished. Um, not necessarily because it's like my best work or anything like that, but um, I just couldn't get it right. Basically, this sea fan, I painted that four times over, um, and it was, it was like banging my head against a brick wall. It was really tricky. Um, so, but, how do you repaint it, sorry, if you decide you want to paint it again? Um, so this is painted on gesso, which is kind of chalk white paint, basically, it's what the base is. This is gesso. Okay. Um, sanded down nice and smooth. So if you wanted to erase that, you just sand it with sandpaper. And you could... It almost feels like a, a very, um, what's the word? Almost like a mix of wood and plastic. Yeah, what yeah, it oh, feels yeah, okay, like fair. to me. It's like a very like clean, fine, finished wood. Very, very fine, yeah. yeah. This is probably too fine, actually. Um, but yeah, that's the kind of the technical elements of preparing your surface before you paint, which I've been learning whilst doing this project. I didn't know, like, really squat about painting, to be quite honest. Um, and it, I'm still learning. Like, the, the painting yeah. I'm doing at the moment, I'm like, oh, I feel like I've unlocked something. I'm like, oh, this is how you paint. Like, I've been doing it wrong for the last year and a half or whatever. Um, and that's, that's an exciting part of the process. And what I think is interesting from an artist perspective, like, from an artistic personal perspective about this project is that by the time I'll finish it, I'll probably be a much better painter than when I started because I started without really knowing how to paint. So that'll be curious to see the, the bits that I did first and think, hmm, looks a bit shoddy now and <laughs> compared to the stuff you do later on. So yeah, um, but yeah, so I can't remember why we were talking about that. Uh, yeah, just the process, the, the process in the, in the studio. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I actually love it. The more time I have in a week to paint, I, I really like that feeling of giving it your all. Um, and with some of my drawings in the past where it's taken me six months, I felt like a zombie after it's been finished because I literally gave it everything I had. Like every evening in the week, you're drawing, you're drawing, you're drawing, you're drawing, you're drawing. You get in this super tunnel visioned frame of mind mm. where it's very difficult to let your mind be flexible. Um, and that's been challenged recently for me because having to do research, having to interpret things in different ways, you can't be as tunnel visioned. Like I have to be able to break away and do other things. Um, and that must be very difficult, right? Because it's so intricate, it's so intense that you almost need that ton of tunnel vision. And once you're in that tunnel vision, it's uh, not easy, but it's easier to stay in it. Mm -hmm. And then having to pull yourself back out of that to like you said, do your research and then get back into that. That's, uh, that must be very difficult. Yeah, it is difficult. Um, the research, it's less difficult to flip-flop from research to painting, um, but like there might be other things like exhibiting, for example, that's quite difficult to switch from because it's a whole different mm, skill set, really, to exhibit. And then you go straight back into the studio and go, right, where's my motivation? Where's that laser focus that I had before? Mm. Um, but the problem with laser focus is just that, like you can't get away from it sometimes and it takes tearing yourself away to to properly commit to something else. 
Yeah. But it requires it requires that commitment, and um, I think that's why my paintings are so detailed because I just get like just crazy involved in it, and I can't look away. And yeah. So I, I did have written down as a question the uh, the biggest piece of work uh, you've done, uh, the, the proudest piece of work you've done. I have a feeling that it, it is this right. It's this project that you're working on at the moment. Yeah. Um, once it's finished, uh, well, like you say, it's, it's being exhibited at the moment, right? Is, 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 that, um, is that correct? Not currently. It's next on exhibition um, in June, July, June the 24th, <laughs> I'm going to say, to kind of mid-July, end of June, mid-July, let's just okay. say, at the LCB depot in uh, Leicester. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Where, where is it going to be exhibited so people can uh, yeah, yeah, so come along and see it? Yeah, absolutely. So it's going to be at the LCB depot. Um, and alongside that show, I'll have like artifacts like this. Do you know, can you figure out what that is? I'm guessing this is pollution that's been that's made its way into the sea. Is that right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's made its, well, it's made its way into a turtle as well. So really, that's plastic that's been recovered from the stomach of a turtle. Wow. Um, and I think it just serves as a good artifact to have in the space yeah. to try and make issues a little less tangible, uh, sorry, a little more tangible, mm. a little less abstract. Yeah, because that, that's had a bit, you know, holding this in my hand and you're asking me what it is, I'm looking at it, I'm like, well, this looks like garbage. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing it's from the sea and then you're telling me it's from the stomach of a turtle. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, just has, a, that has much more of an impact than telling me, you know, garbage is found in stomachs of turtles. Yeah, factoids. I mean, yeah. they're good, they're interesting, but artifacts are more powerful and... It, you know, part of my challenge as well is to try and gather up some artifacts, including this sort of thing, and, and put them part of the exhibition. So it's not just about, it's not really about my paintings. The idea is it's about the ocean. And my challenge is how do I make my exhibition about the ocean? So when you walk mm. in, you feel like you're immersed by the sea and the good things about it, as well as the issues that you face. Yeah. So but, the painting, it, it is, as you said, a vehicle for this discussion to communicate to people the issues and, and what we need to do about them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And that next exhibition will be uh, end of June, uh, sorry, yeah, to July. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to make sure to put that in the show notes so uh, people can come along. And yeah, thanks. And I'll, I'll definitely come along. <laughs> yeah, definitely come along myself. Yeah, please. Um, to kind of round it all off, I, I wanted to ask you the meaning of life. Meaning because, of life. The meaning of life, yeah, which wow. is a question I ask pretty much every guest. It's a good question. Because um, obviously we've talked about how powerful art is and, and I've said it a couple of times and I'll say it again. I, I really think art is able, there are so many things in this world that cannot be communicated through words, through language, but can be communicated through art. There's, there, there's something about it, whether it's music or whether it's visual art in the forms of drawings, paintings, there's something that is so powerful and and uh, able to convey things that we, we can't verbalize in any kind of way. Um, that's what I'm trying to verbalize it now. And, and I can't, it gives you a feeling, right? It gives you a feeling that you can't, um, yeah, that you can't verbalize. And, and, and you've, you've spoken as well. Uh, throughout this conversation about kind of like the existentialness of it, the uh, the deeper the deeper elements of your work, and I, I always think as uh, the ocean is always used as like a metaphor for existentialism because you've got the surface of the ocean, which is just what most people see, what most people interact with, and then you have everything beneath it, and so few of us in this world actually even think about the fact that there's everything beneath the surface. I do think that, that it, it is such a, a good metaphor for life because we get so caught up in the day-to-day -day, um, monotony, you know, our mundane living that we don't necessarily think about the deeper things. We don't examine ourselves. We don't examine the world around it, the world around us. So <clears throat> what to you is the meaning of life? Uh, what, what is the ultimate purpose in all of this? And how has art helped you decipher that and then interact with that throughout your life i don't think there is any meaning to life i think 
the meaning of life is one that you ascribe for yourself and that will be different for different people. For me, I think I found the meaning of life by discovering something that I find interesting. I later came to care a lot about and to make that my purpose, basically, to communicate how amazing this thing is. It's the ocean. Um, and also I'd add on that to always try and realize that you're a flawed individual. Like, so I, I criticize myself quite a lot, I'd say. Um, and I like to think that I can be better and, you know, take, try and take on the criticism of other people, whether that's about my drawings and paintings so that I can make them in a better fashion or about my character. You know, if my partner's saying like, oh, you know, you, you don't do this or you don't do that, not in a nagging way, but like in a, in a real way, you know, I'm not good at those things. Take that on board, try and put your ego aside and say, okay, well, can I improve as a person? Um, because the, the perspectives of other people are valid and I can maybe uh, improve personally and professionally if I take all those criticisms on board and actually try and change for the better. So when you put all those things together, you hopefully create a life that has had meaning and value for other people as well as yourself. Um, and that's probably how I would summarize my attitude towards life. That's brilliant. Thank you, Ollie. I I'm, I'm going to take a, a lot away from, uh, from our conversation today, uh, both in terms of the work you're doing and the, the tangible issues, but then as well, um, kind of like the, uh, the philosophy, for lack of a better word, that you've woven into it and how it applies to life and how we can all be better and do better for ourselves, for the people around us, and for ultimately this world that we live on, live yeah. in. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, and uh, thanks for inviting me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. It's and absolutely my pleasure. If, you're, if your followers want to find me on uh, yes, yeah, sorry, media, yeah, yeah. Where, where can people find you? Um, on Instagram, you can um, Olivier underscore Leisure uh, is my Instagram account, um, and that's where you'll find like a lot of my uh, kind of progress on this painting in particular. So if you want to see what we've been talking about, it'll be there. I also have a YouTube channel um, where I try and make videos about all my paintings and things like that. And is that where the Atlas documentary is? Is that on your YouTube and channel? And Atlas, the Atlas documentary is on YouTube as well. So that's me okay, going that's through my little existential crisis. So if you want to watch that, you're more yeah. welcome. Yeah, no, no, I'm definitely going to. <laughs> yeah, it's, they, yeah. Did a, they did a really great uh, job at Fishbulb Films, so thanks to them as well. That's brilliant. Thanks, Ollie. Cheers, Aaron. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Cheers.